Very good morning, brothers and sisters of uh, Bethany EFC. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm thankful that once again I can be back in your midst, and today I'm dressed for the occasion. Uh, it's Mission Month, so uh, Pastor Desmond helped to choose this. So I thought, unfortunately, he can't see it, but he'll see it on the video. But thankfully today I get to share with you a message from Romans. Romans is a very rich theological book. It's wonderful. It talks about uh, the whole concepts of law and grace. And it really uh, presents to us uh, uh, the whole importance of the gospel, in fact. And in the middle of that, uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 12 to 15, uh, I'd like to argue that over here we actually see not just what the gospel uh, in terms of theory or theology, but the gospel at work. And this is really uh, Paul's passion. And today, so I want to share with you a message called who shall go uh, i suspect it's a pretty straightforward question with a very unsurprising answer but before we go into that today i, I do want to ask you one question in terms of mission you've been hearing uh, different missionaries different agencies uh, sharing to you every october i wonder what you think about when you really think about the word missions what was your first impression uh, when you think of the word missionary uh, what do you think of our which uh, what image comes to your mind what kind of person is that uh, I don't know, but I would somehow dare to think that many of us, myself included, I used to think of missionaries as people uh, who go to exotic places, the faraway locations, the select few in church. We would call them the bold, the brave, or, or sometimes the foolish, the ones who are daring enough to go places where others won't or can't. Well, from one perspective, uh, that's not too far off from what mission work sometimes looks like. Uh, certainly through history, uh, that they are the bold, the brave, the noble ones, the ones who've received the highest calling from the Lord. But you know, throughout the church history, I like what uh, Dr. Violet James from Singapore Bible College said. She said, actually, there's been pendulum shifts throughout church history. And uh, what co was considered the most noble task for a Christian has changed throughout history. Uh, in the early days, if you wanted to be uh, a a firm, unwavering believer, uh, the first M to represent that highest calling would be a martyr. You see, uh, just the fact of you want to be a Christian, a believer, in the early days, I'm sure you all know, it was not the easiest thing to do. In fact, if you did not want to worship the emperor as your lord, uh, well, you might uh, die. You might die for your faith. So for many hundreds of years, Christendom and Christians in general, the highest calling was to die for our Lord. And it's still prevalent today in some parts of the world. Um, so, but later on though, if you know church history, you realize that, uh, well, uh, the church was no longer in danger. In fact, the church became the uh, official religion. Christianity became the official religion of Rome. And so there was corruption that also came into this because watered down faith was a temptation. So people would start to go into the deserts. Uh, that's where we get the term desert fathers from. And people would start gathering in monasteries to be silent for long periods of time, to be segregated from society so that they could be a blessing to society. And this whole idea was monasticism was now the highest call. To be a monk, to be a nun, that was the highest call for a Christian for many uh, centuries. Uh, to be separate, to be holy, set apart for the Lord in order to draw close to the Lord and be a blessing to the nations. Uh, that was for a period of time. But there was a third M, and that's the M we're talking about today. Uh, throughout the past few hundred uh, years, uh, missionary movements have uh, gained momentum, uh, and missionary movements have, uh, in many Christian minds, uh, have become the highest calling uh, for a believer. Uh, in fact, we've sometimes even romanticized this idea of serving the Lord as a missionary. Uh, in Chinese songs, we sing uh, words like, English songs, the same thing. We, we romanticize it sometimes. Uh, we say, uh, Jesus, I believe in you, and I would go to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth for you. Uh, and it's great if that's really what you mean, and not just singing the lyrics of a song. But on a practical note, as a pastor, I realized that sometimes, let's not talk about the ends of the earth. Sometimes I tell my church members, hey, can you go with me to Bunlei, to Woodlands? And they already say, oh, that's very far, you know. Uh, that's the ends of the earth for them. And so I, I wonder, you know, sometimes we think that mission movements or missionaries are reserved for the brave and the bold, for the select few in the church. Now, in fact, uh, many people throughout history also kind of pushed back against mission movements. Uh, William Carey, as you know, uh, when he wanted to go to India, some church leaders uh, actually said to him, young man, sit down. If God wants to convert the barbarians, the heathen, he can do it without you, he can do it without me. 
And I wonder whether some of us think the same way. God, God, you are all powerful. You can do your mission work without my help. In fact, I don't want to trouble you. I will cause more trouble. God, do your work without my help. And uh, I think that's the mentality of many Christians today. Uh, recently, I was involved in Go Forth uh, this year. Uh, I'm part of the Baptist uh, uh, denomination, so uh, the Baptists are in charge this year. And what happened was uh, uh, in that committee, uh, we had different mission organizations coming. And one of the leaders said something that I thought was so honest, yet something we don't really hear in church. Uh, the leader said when it comes to missions, uh, no church, uh, no Christian will ever say it's a bad thing. When it comes to missions, everyone will say, oh, this is good, we should support it. But the leader also said, the truth is, though, not many get involved. They, they say it's a good thing, but it's really a distant thing. We talk about it once a year, perhaps, but it's not something that we're truly passionate or thinking about. Uh, that led me to think of a theme for my church uh, mission month. We had our mission month in May, and we had a little playful theme. Uh, don't kick me out of church after I teach you this, but can I teach you? There are some hand actions. So can you do this? Uh, point to yourself and say, here I am, Lord. Okay, let's try that. One, two, three. Here I am, Lord. And then point to the person beside you and say, send him, send her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so uh, I have to uh, at least justify that we put a question mark at the end of that, whether that's correct or not. But uh, I've tried this in about eight different churches the past few months. And every time we say send him or her, too many of you are happy about that, you know. Too many people are so happy to send someone else by yourself. You know, uh, Isaiah, obviously we know, says, here I am, Lord, send me. But uh, I really want us to think about that this morning. When we look at Romans chapter 10, verse 12 to 15, I think we see there the heart of Paul's uh, whole mission work. We see the heart of the gospel, and I, I would challenge that we also see the heart of God. So today, as we talk about who shall go, it's a simple question, and it's not a surprising answer. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to speak to us. Father, we thank you for your presence in this room. We thank you that you are in our hearts, you are in this place, and Lord, you have something to say to each and every one of us this morning. Lord, speak to us. And let our convictions become actions. Let uh, what we hear today, we respond to your invitation, Lord. We thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this passage and we answer the question, who shall go? I think uh, we're going to look at the first two verses. It says in verses 12 to 13, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, the passage starts with an all-important statement, central to, to the theology of salvation, in fact. You see, uh, in Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 22 to 23, uh, Paul had said a very similar phrase. There he said there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, here he's saying there's no distinction between Jews and Greeks. But in chapter 3, it was actually bad news. In chapter 3, he was saying there's no distinction. Jews, Gentiles, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory about God. So it's bad news. All of us are sinners. But here, the good news starts to show up in chapter 10. It says, all of us, whether Jews and Greeks, all of us have the same Lord. Every single one of us who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the church needs to remember this. God does not look at our skin color, our race, our country, our politics, or our past. All are welcome at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. That was not convicting enough. We will try that again in a few moments when I try to convince you a little bit more from Romans. But coming back from the mission field, I have to admit that sometimes when we go to these uh, developing countries, Singaporeans, we tend to bring a I'm better than you kind of mentality. Sometimes we're guilty of that saying, oh, uh, I'm smarter than you, I'm richer than you, I'm better fed than you. And we go there with that kind of mentality, forgetting that the same Lord who is the Lord of the Singaporean Christians are also the same Lord of the Indonesian. Indian, Filipino, Malaysian Christians as well. Amen? Amen. Ah, we're trying that again and again. Ah, let's see whether it gets louder. But I hate to say this, but sometimes uh, in the church, even though we don't say it, there is almost an elitism in our faith. There's even a racism that we don't mention of. 
but are all truly welcome here? Well, the scripture is very clear. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In fact, when we look at the verse here uh, uh, in the last part of verse 13, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This was not a new idea. Uh, in fact, the prophet Joel uh, in chapter 2, verse 32, uh, actually said before, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved in the Old Testament. But here's the thing, in the Old Testament, when a Jewish person was reading it, they might have thought, oh, well, every Jew is saved. Uh, my own people are saved. But put in the theology and the context of Romans, we know that every Jew, every Greek, every Chinese, Indian, Malay, Eurasian, everyone is welcome at the feet of Jesus. It's available to the Ukrainian. It's available also to the Russian. It's available to those in Israel. It's also available to those in Hamas. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I really ask that because uh, when we think about it, we know the simple answer here is everyone can be saved. Every single person can be saved. Scripture tells us very clear. Uh, but how do we apply that to our own um, uh, living out of the faith? Um, I'm guilty of this as well because as a pastor, obviously, I need to preach and tell everyone you're welcome in the church. But you know, uh, I think I shared before, when I go to the army, I'm very ashamed of tell pe telling people that <laughs> I'm a pastor. I was very shy about it. So the first time I went to the army, I always told people uh, I'm a teacher. And they tell me, what do I teach? And I always say, well, everything. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so, but that's it. Now they finally knew. They finally knew uh, I'm a pastor. In fact, now they jokingly see me. They say, Father, Father. And I'm like, well, we don't, they don't call me Father at church, but I, I just let it go, right? And, and later on, you know, I realized that uh, in my own buddies, I have this abeng, uh, head to toe, all tattoos, uh, and uh, every other sentence of his is swear words. So that's the kind of uh, person I have in my buddy system. And the other buddy is a Taoist priest. And so I have a Taoist priest, Abeng, we are serving together in the army. And the Lord was really convicting me this September when I went back for my reservice. Because this uh, Abeng came to me and said, Hey, Kenya, uh, seriously, uh, one day can I, can I come to your church or not? And I remember my previous answer. Last year, I actually told him, if you know you want to come to my church, I don't think I don't think can. Can you go somewhere else, <laughs> right? So I actually joked with him. I said, "Don't come. I will put your face on the thing. Don't don't welcome this person in." Um, but when I went home, I really regretted that answer. Uh, you know, this guy. I know he's joking, but I said, "Lord, you know, if he asks again, could I answer more gracefully?" And, and this year. Um, uh, he actually uh, had an issue. One of, my, uh, one of my army buddies was trying to commit suicide, and he, the Abeng of all people, cared the most. And he called me and said, I don't know who to talk about. I, I know you're a pastor. Uh, can you help? And so we had to activate the army and the police to deal with this issue. But uh, throughout that situation, I got to speak on, to him on the phone for an hour and, and, a, and a half. And during that hour and a half, I, I remember just ending and saying, you know, any time you, you want, you're welcome, let's meet. Uh, in fact, we can pray together as well. And he did not reject it this time. You know, and I, I thank God for this opportunity because it was reminding me, and I hope it reminds you, that everyone can come to the feet of Jesus. Everyone has a chance and should have a chance to be saved. Now, we know that everyone can be saved, uh, but you know, the simple answer about uh, uh, who can be saved is interesting, but more importantly, Paul actually even addressed how can they be saved. And uh, here, it's not a step-by-step -step of how to share the gospel, but an even more practical answer than that. He asked for rhetorical hows uh, here. How, 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 how. You'll see that uh, in the passage below. And would you follow with me here? It says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him um, of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And lastly, how are they to preach unless they are sent? These are rhetorical questions. Uh, you don't have to think too hard what he's trying to say, but you do have to work from the reverse backwards. Uh, often in the New Testament, when there's a list, you can actually go backwards. And here you see the list in reverse order is someone needs to be sent. And when that individual is sent, someone can share and preach the gospel to them. And when we preach the gospel to those who have not heard, they have a chance finally to hear. And when they hear, some have a chance to believe. And some, when they believe, well, they'll call. They'll call in the name of Jesus. And thankfully, in verse 13, we know that the promise is everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. 
Now, this is not a complicated passage to understand. Paul's logic is simple but profound. One cannot call on the Lord, one cannot be saved unless someone is sent to them. One cannot believe in Jesus Christ unless they have heard the gospel. They have heard and had a chance, an opportunity in their life to hear because someone made the decision to go. Hearing is impossible unless there is someone to preach to them. Uh, most, if not all of you in this room, someone invited you to church or someone invited your family member to church. And that's the reason you are here today. The primary way that the church has to realize uh, people are saved is someone needs to be sent. Paul's telling you a very simple answer here. Someone has to go. Someone has to go to the nations, go to your neighbors, go to your colleagues, go to your family members so that they have a chance to hear about the good news and then respond. And here's the very interesting thing I think that the church needs to remember. The primary way people are saved in the past and even today is when the church obeys the call to send. The primary way, you know, there are some people who come to know of the Lord through dreams and visions, but that's not the primary way. The most important, fundamental, and simple way that people come to hear the Lord is when we go and not just come. You know, some of us have become so used to becoming, uh, I hate to say this, but seat warmers in the church. You know, you're, you're so used to coming on Sunday, it's a habit in your life. But when was the last time you said, hey, I'm going to bring someone to church? And for those who are not willing to come to church, when was the last time you said, hey, I'm going to bring the church to them through my witness and through my testimony? You know, it's very important. In fact, wherever I have been over the past uh, two years in my mission work, I keep hearing of lives impacted because someone sometime in the past was sent to them. Uh, I remember going to uh, uh, Bintan and not the holiday part of Bintan, but the local site. And uh, Brother Eliza was sharing with me where uh, his family used to be, come from a long line of generations of boat people. So 100% of them, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, always lived on boats. Uh, they lived there, they, uh, they lived their lives there, they did their fishing on the boats. And so they literally were fishermen. Until one day, Eliza told, told me uh, that a missionary came on a boat and shared the gospel to his uh, grandparents. And now he's the third generation of pastors in his family. Uh, he has gone, I like to say, from being fishermen to fishers of men. And we praise God it happened because somebody was sent into his midst. Someone made the decision to sit a sampan, a small little boat, go out to them and share the gospel to these people. Uh, I also remember Brother Daniel. Brother Daniel I recently met and he shared how he was studying nursing, uh, but due to financial difficulties, he tried to kill himself three times. And uh, of those three times, one time he went to the street of India and tried to just stand there hoping someone would kill him, knock him down. I guess the drivers in India are too professional. Everyone's san, lai san chi. Yeah? So he is still here today, but you know, during his most uh, loneliest times, his lowest point in his life, someone came to him and shared the hope that he can have in Jesus Christ. You know, today he's graduated from nursing and he's taken that skill of nursing and trained other people to help the homeless people in the streets of India. He is now literally the hands and feet of Jesus, uh, helping people and to heal the wounded. All because someone was sent to him, someone gave him hope. Lastly, I remember uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, Pastor Desmond, uh, Brother Kasim and myself and uh, Pastor Ka uh, Simon, we went to this beautiful island uh, in Indonesia. And I was amazed because uh, not just of the wonderful people you see in the photo, uh, but of the, uh, the statue right behind me. And this is not real. This is uh, more local. It's just a couple hours away from Singapore. And um, it's a statue of uh, Jesus blessing the nation or blessing the island. And I said, how come you can do that? And she said, because, well, 80% of the island are Christians. And I said, well, how come there are so many Christians on this island? And she said, because 192 years ago, missionaries came to our island. 192 years ago, missionaries came to share the good news. And today, uh, Sister Ayu, who is the one in the, on the right in this photo, uh, serves in a denomination that has more than a thousand churches on this island and beyond. Uh, all because someone was sent to them 192 years ago. You see, how are they saved? Uh, Paul has a simple but profound answer. Uh, I'll just show you a video of uh, this. Uh, um, 
Uh, these are all Bible translators, uh, people who are serving the Lord uh, within the ministry uh, there. And all of them are ages, I think, from 20 all the way to 70. And what was amazing about this is uh, I just kept thinking, what if 192 years ago, someone did not go and share the gospel to them? What if 192 years ago, someone said, uh, not now? You know what was interesting is she told me, 191 years ago, uh, missionaries from another religion came. Uh, but too late because the Christians already came. So we, we thank God for uh, those people who are brave enough to go. Um, so we've answered two questions. We've said uh, who can be saved, uh, how can they be saved, uh, and very, the primary reason is through people being sent. Uh, importantly, when we talk about missions, I think missions ultimately is an invitation uh, for us to go out and to be a blessing to the world. And we know that missions ultimate goal is for people to be saved. Uh, it's not that complicated. But really, at the end of the day, we go back to the question we started with for this sermon. Who, who should go? Um, remember the theme, here I am, Lord, uh, send him, uh, send her. Uh, I, I hope you realize I'm joking. Uh, don't, don't just be so happy and send him or her. Uh, I hope you realize that it's a rhetorical question. Another way to see this uh, is we should be saying, here we are, Lord, send us. Um, but rather than always pointing fingers, um, and just saying, I'll pray for you, someone else, and pray for Pastor Kenny. How about today you pray for yourself and say, God, how can I be sent to those around me? Uh, I want to point us to the final part of this short passage today, uh, which is here in verse 15. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You know, one way to look at this is uh, Paul is uh, commending those who preach the gospel. And for us today, we might say, yes, we commend the missionaries, the mission agencies, the brave and the bold, the few and the foolish that go out uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. We applaud their efforts. We say, good job. Uh, that, that's great. But I, I wonder whether we can also challenge you with this same phrase and ask, are your feet beautiful? Are, are your feet going are you sharing the good news to others? Because based on this simple description from the Old Testament and also in the New here, you know, the whole idea is that the best thing you can do with your life, the best thing you can do with your feet, is to go and share the gospel with somebody. Uh, so very importantly, look at yourself and ask a question this morning. Are your feet uh, beautiful? You know, if we look back at the diagram, uh, the call to be sent uh, in Chinese is a little bit misleading because the word preach is actually translated as chuan dao. And chuan dao, sometimes in church, we say that is uh, the literal translation of pastor. So we sometimes go, oh, chuan dao, yeah, yeah, chuan dao, pastors go and preach. But you know, the, the more simple meaning of this word is to share the gospel you know, uh, evangelism. Uh, to go and share the good news is really what Paul is trying to say here. Uh, to go and share the good news is not a responsibility of just the pastors, but of every single believer. You know, uh, a famous passage that we always read uh, in, um, in the Gospels is this, right? The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, I, I, I always try to imagine this, like imagine you were Peter or John, and you're praying this. As Jesus says this, you pray, say, Lord, send out workers into the harvest field. Imagine Peter passionately praying, and then hearing the next few words that Jesus says, Go, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. So here, the idea is you should pray, but you should also go. You don't just pray for the mission work, you also say, Lord, how can you use me? in the mission work as well. And so very importantly, we have to realize go is a very important word in the New Testament. In fact, that's the most powerful and important verb, right? In the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples uh, of all nations. Now I know the objection some of you still have in your hearts. You say, you know, when we talk about the word missionary, we don't call most people missionaries. Uh, we kind of reserve that term in church for the select few that go overseas. Uh, so some of you will be saying, you know, uh, surely not all of us are called to be missionaries. And if your definition is going overseas, going to distant lands to share the gospel, I agree with you. Not all of us are called to do that. Not all of us might have the capacity or are in that life stage where we can just go and put down everything and uh, go and share the gospel in the remote nations. But I like what my uncle said. My uncle is also serving in the, the, the church. 
And he says, well, not all of us are called to be missionaries, but all of us are called to missions. Do you, do you see the difference there? Not all of us are called to be missionaries, per se, going to faraway lands, but all of us are called to respond to the Great Commission. We are called to obey the call to go. And this is for everyone. So you see, who should go? The answer, like I mentioned, is simple, not surprising, but a challenge to us all. Every disciple of Jesus Christ, we need to think about what go means in our lives today. What does that mean for every single individual in this room? You know, as a personal testimony, uh, I just wanted to share that um, uh, last year when I was making the, uh, the either brave or foolish decision to become the director of Ambassadors for Christ Singapore, uh, many people have been walking alongside me. Uh, I thank God for many teachers, uh, many uh, pastors like Daniel, like Pastor Desmond, who have given me many opportunities to learn from them. But interestingly, what I, I found was, um, you know, not just learning from them, but the comments that I hear uh, from different people. Uh, and so these are just pictures of uh, what we're doing in the ministry. If you want to understand these stories, stay behind after the service. So I'll tell the stories more in detail. But really, what I, I'm always surprised is people come to me, a lot of my friends, and say, wow, Pastor Kenny, you're doing your dream job. Like, bao chi, bao zu, bao fei ji piao. You know, they say everything is uh, uh, paid for. I get to fly to exotic locations to preach. And he's, they, they say, this must be your dream job. And, and, and you know, deep down, I, I struggle with that because I told them, honestly, it's not my dream job. It's not my dream job to go to places where Christians are not necessarily welcome. Uh, not every location is like that island in Indonesia. Uh, it's not my dream job to uh, put my life and sometimes my health in jeopardy. In fact, uh, when we went uh, for a mission trip uh, to one of our locations, uh, six out of our eight pastors got sick. Uh, two of them ended up in the hospital, myself included. And so that said, uh, it's not something that I would say is our dream job, going to places and risking our lives, risking our health. And it's definitely not my dream job to leave my wife and my children behind for long periods of time. I think that for me has been the biggest challenge. In fact, while I was traveling with Pastor Desmond and uh, Brother Kasim this time, uh, my mother-in-law had to be rushed to the hospital in Singapore. Uh, and a lot of things ha were happening while I was overseas. Uh, the second time I was about to fly, uh, my grandmother-in-law was very sick in Shanghai. And so we had to take care of the kids. My wife had to fly to Shanghai and I had to fly to Mission Field. And so it was really tricky. It's not my dream job. In fact, if I were to be honest, my dream mission job is something like this. Uh, God, if you want to send me, send me to somewhere like this, uh, they need the Lord as well. You know? And uh, I, I'm gladly uh, happy to go there for one, two, three years. You know? um, and, and I think this is also a picture of us. We say, send me, Lord, but within my own preference, within my comfort zone. Send me, Lord, but here's the terms and conditions. You know, and, and I wonder, sometimes the question is not who should go, but you ask yourself, like, why should I go? You know, because you're actually thinking it's so hard, it's so challenging. That's why only a few people in church go. Um, and I wanted to share with you how I went through this thought process, and hopefully it helps you as well. Uh, as I was praying about this two or three years ago, and, and being challenged and saying, God, it's definitely not my dream job. It's definitely not where I want to be if you gave me a choice. But why should I go, Lord? And as I prayed, uh, God reminded me of a song. It's a song I sang since I was the age of 15. Uh, some of you might know this song. Uh, it's called Making a Difference. Uh, it was actually written by a Singaporean, uh, my secondary school uh, senior. Uh, and he wrote this song many years ago. Um, he likes to call it MAD. Uh, he hopes people will be making a difference, M-A-D, MAD for Jesus. Right? Uh, but here's the thing. Look at the words. It's a prayer. It says, won't you, Lord, take a look at our hands? Everything you have, use it for your plans. Won't you, Lord, take a look at our hearts, mold it, refine it as you set us apart. And I love the lyrics of the chorus. It says, we want to run to the altar, catch the fire, and then we stand in the gap between the living and the dead. Lord, give us a heart of compassion for a world without vision. We will make a difference, bringing hope to our land. You, you know, I never really knew, know, knew where this passage came from or this song came from uh, until one day I read the book of Numbers. 
And I was reading through the book of Numbers, and we saw here where Israel had once again rebelled against God. God was going to punish them. And Moses sent Aaron running. It says here, you know, Moses said to Aaron, take your censer, put fire on it from the altar, and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. So he says, run into the midst of the people and uh, make atonement for them, for they have angered, they have sinned against the Lord. And here Moses did as Moses, uh, Aaron did and Moses said. He ran into the midst of the assembly and the plague had already began. And what I want you to picture here is this. As he was running and making atonement for the people, he stood between the dead and the living. Can, can you imagine that picture in your mind for a moment? He's holding the fire and he's standing between the dead and the living. And if we truly understand the Gospels today, uh, that's what every believer is trying to do, right? We're trying to redirect traffic. We're trying to say, hey, you who are going down the path without hope, come, these are the words of life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we want to redirect the traffic from the dead to the living. And, and I wonder whether this could be our prayer today. You see, when I think about Moses and Aaron and what their why was, uh, like why did he do the thing he did? Why did he run? Uh, I think one word that comes to my mind is the word compassion. Uh, Moses and Aaron had compassion for his people. I, I wonder whether today we have grown numb because of the news that we're reading today, the constant bombardment of negativity in the world. We no longer have compassion for people. You see, the church needs to be a place of compassion. That we need to be a place that says, Lord, send me to wherever there are people hurting. Send me to wherever they need to hear the words of hope. Lord, send me, make me, give me hearts of compassion. I, I pray that's our prayer today. Uh, when I was in Indonesia with Brother Kasim and Pastor Desmond, uh, I heard this little girl sing. Brother Kasim, you'll probably remember. Uh, and I wanted to share with you, um, uh, not the most professional of singing, but I, I hope you capture her heart. You know, uh, as she sings uh, and we play this song, um, I, I hope you can hear the lyrics and make that our prayer this morning. carry the light. Um, I wonder whether you caught the lyrics there. She said, how will they know? And that really captures the heart of what Paul is saying. How will they know if we don't go and share the gospel? Uh, friends, today, uh, I hope the message is not about how you can support AFC, but how you can respond to the gospel's message that we must go, that we have to. In fact, when I think about the question, um, why should I go? Uh, that question has changed in my mind and in my heart. It's no longer why should I go, but when we think about it, it's how could I not? You know, how could I not, after receiving the words of truth, not try to live my life in a way that impacts, blesses people around me? How could I not realize that we are blessed to be a blessing? So today I want to challenge you with two words, just two words, and hopefully you can remember that. The first one is very simple. Our response to the gospel and our response to the idea of missions is all of us needs to go. 
Now, it could mean that some of you will be called to be missionaries to faraway lands, but it could more likely mean for many of you here, we want to be a blessing to our neighbors, to our colleagues, to our family members who still don't know Jesus, that, Lord, would you send us to be a blessing to them? Would we intentionally pray for them and intentionally say, God, use me this year before the end of the year to bring one more person to the Lord? Could that be our honest and sincere prayer? And, and lastly, I think when we think about it, um, I, I thought about this wall that I saw in India. Uh, this wall was all across the highways. And I asked my friends there, I said, why are there walls on the highway? And, and he explained to me, uh, brother, you don't realize behind these highways are the slums. Uh, it's very ugly. We don't want foreigners to see that. So these walls are to block away the ugly things in our society. And, and I thought about that, and I wonder whether our church sometimes has become too sanitized. We're, we're too nice, too comfortable, uh, too clean here, uh, that we forgot that we're supposed to go beyond the four walls of the church, to the slums, to the homeless, to the hurting, um, and to the least, the last. And so that said, uh, I want to challenge you to go and lastly to give. Give not just of money, but give of your time, give of your lives. And, and more importantly, unapologetically I say this, give as much as you can. You know, the, the church needs to realize that we need to be radical in this generation. Uh, there are so many people today that are filled with hurt in their lives. Uh, and we need to go so that one day they can call upon the name of Jesus. Let's test again. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Much louder. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to lead you in this song as our response song. Um, we're going to sing it once in English. And for our brothers and sisters in the room, we're also going to sing it in Mandarin one time. Uh, if you can, could you rise? We'll just sing this together. We'll sing this as a response song. If you know the song, you can sing it with me. If you don't know the song, uh, you just uh, learn it first, and then we'll uh, and then we'll worship together. Won't you, Lord, take a look at our hands? Today, I just want to invite you to just spend a moment before the Lord and just respond to His invitation. Uh, if you've li been living somewhat lukewarm lives, ask the Lord to light the fire again. If you know of uh, family members, uh, friends, colleagues, students, that you have a burden, the Lord has put a burden in your heart to reach them, pray for them right now. And if the Lord has even given you that bold uh, willingness, uh, that fearless heart to say, Lord, here I am, send me. Send me wherever you may lead. Pray that prayer in your heart.
Father, I pray for my brothers, my sisters in this room. I thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God. You are slow to anger. You are rich in love. And Lord, we thank you that we got a chance in our lives to get to know you, to hear the gospel. But there are so many people in this world that haven't got that chance, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would put that urgency in our hearts, Lord, not just to walk, but like Aaron, to run, to run to the altar and say, Lord, we'll take this fire, take this passion, take this word of hope and go into the nations, go among our friends, our families, and everyone that you give us a chance to meet, to be a blessing to them. Lord, hear our prayer, Lord. Let Bethany be a blessing in this neighborhood, a blessing to the nations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just sing this one last time? We sing it together as a prayer. Won't you, Lord? Won't you, Lord, take a look at our hands? Say everything we have together. Everything we have. Use it for your plans. Won't you, Lord, take a look at our hands?